I've never tried laying tracks and points on a hill, but how hard can it be? Hi, welcome to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. And in this video, I'm going to build the approach as it runs up into my branch line station. So here is the plan in um, a program called AnyRail, and this is drawn up by Lee Soddart, who is my um, technical advisor, let's say. He really is a gifted guy as far as this program is concerned, and he has probably forgotten more about AnyRail than I will ever know. In this area here, we can see that here's the viaduct and this is the end of the board where the viaduct board ends and the next one starts. These are the two rails that run down towards the uh, helix and if I bring the helix on you can see where it is. Now it's obviously quite important for this station to sit above the helix. These lines drop down around about one and a half inches and I thought well these will probably rise up one and a half inches giving me a three inch gap between a three inch height difference between here and here and make it more interesting getting away from the sort of flat earth concept. But the angle up here can be a little bit more interesting I think. So I'm going to put an extra inch on here because I haven't got sort of 10 coach trains coming up here. This is going to be fundamentally a DMU type area and the parcels type uh, station. So we've got platform one here, platform two. This yellow line, interestingly, Lee thought we could leave at the uh, discretion of Dr. Beeching. So this is uh, a leftover from the Beeching cuts. So what happens? Well, we come off the viaduct, come through here. Um, if you're going to run up into, into platform one, you'll just go straight on. If you want platform two, you'll come through this right hand point through the uh, double slip and then up into platform two, quite straightforward really. And obviously platform one, you'll come back through the double, uh, the double slip and on the up line. To get into the goods area, naturally you'd come through that point, through the double slip again, come back up and there's a point here, takes you into the goods area, and then there's a head shunt for you to get your locomotive out back on the other end and away. All kind of makes sense. Obviously with the helix, I need some clearance and um, one and a half inches coming up here would do so two and a half inches will be even better and board wise I'm going to make this board that comes over this area and contains these uh, these tracks today and then I will have another board here with a station on and another board in the front just with scenics the reason for that is I can easily remove that board because there'll be nothing else on it if I need to do some maintenance on the helix like if I have a accident let's say and I end up with half my trains uh, on the base of the helix which will obviously have padding and um, bubble wrap and all that sort of thing in it just in case of uh, a catastrophe. So most of the points are on this board here there are two on the station board um, so let's set about sorting out this board. But I thought first we'd have a look at Barnstable Victoria Road as it was well long before Dr Beeching came out to play and unlike um, my plan is you're not going to have a this had a single track rather than the double track obviously I need the double track to come off the viaduct so it was a single track in and then it came into the, the, stat, the uh, main platform and there was a run around here for the steam engine to jump on the other end of a couple of coaches and also a little bay platform up here and then the good sidings were around here but what myself and Lee are proposing is to flip it vertically. So you've now got the line coming up which splits and goes into the platform. There's the line that was in yellow on the uh, any rail plan which will be the redundant Dr Beeching left over and then two good sidings in, in place of these. But where are we today? Well things have changed considerably and I must thank David Griffith for these images and a lot of supporting documentation which he sent over. So there's the single line now coming into the station and sadly the bay platform has gone along with all those good sidings that were here and there's now a major road coming through this rather impressive cutting. And the land has completely changed its use and now B&Q have come out to play and have put a very very large warehouse in here and there's lots of infrastructure and I think that uh, the Victoria 
road that was actually running through here has actually gone completely. But there we are, there's the, the station building still remains and just the basic structure um, that previously existed. But it's, there's not much left, let's be perfectly honest. And it's in the spirit of this station that we're doing it, not as any kind of prototypical rerun, as it were. It's just in the, it, with, a, with a feel of what Barnstable Station used to be like. And in reality, this is what it looks like. Coming off the viaduct board there, there goes the lines down to the helix. And obviously across the back now, we need to put in the new board. And that's roughly where it's going to go. So what I need to do now is build up um, the incline and also to trim this board off so that we have enough room for um, an embankment or a uh, retaining wall that runs along there. Now with a marker pen I can run it along the lines down to the helix and that will show me where I need to cut the board to the right size. And there we have it. Well, courtesy of a jigsaw. Stun the cruise, it was cold out there. So now I need to um, start jacking it up and trying to get the, uh, the incline right. So what I need for that is a few sort of U-shaped kind of supports that will come off of these, uh, this open frame here. It's very similar to what I did before with this structure. Now these tracks were from the helix were only here as a temporary measure um, just to check that the whole thing would work and um, that I could get the trains to go from one boosted area into another. Uh, which I did in the last video. So I think, and the tracks will have to come up anyway for the foam underlay to go underneath. So I think I want to remove the tracks and these boards now to make my access a little easier. But before I do that, I will mark up exactly where these tracks go. And as a temporary measure, I'd secure the track using these tiny little screws from Pico, which obviously makes removing the track so much easier rather than trying to pull up nails, tacks or, or glue or whatever. I'm going quite heavy on the timber here perhaps over engineered but I just thought it uh, better safe than sorry really okay now it's just a case of cutting it off at the right height And I think that looks about right. So we shall trim these off. The first cross member in and level. So let's pop the board on top and see how it looks. So there's the, the first cross member, but I've also now installed the second one. And this one is only marginally lower than this one. So that when the slope comes up, it will kind of ease off because the last thing I want is a um, a, a kind of a step between here and the next board so it'll come up more, more steeply into this one and then lose that kind of lose part of most of the incline as it gets to this one here. 
So I shall pop this board back on and then see how it looks. And if I use a clamp, we'll be able to take the, the curve out. And also, if I fit that lower track bed, we'll get a better appreciation of how it's all sitting, whoops, how it's all sitting together. Well, I think it's too steep. And it is, it's a 4% rise. The distance here though is quite good, I must confess, because it does give you a nice vertical um, effect of running between the two, uh, the two layers. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this down by about a half an inch um, and then see if we can reduce that to 3%. So after a little bit of tweaking, we've now got the incline down to 2.4% and this isn't the strongest DMU you've ever seen but it can certainly manage this incline without any real problems. So I'd like to say that we're good to go and uh, we'll put the rest of the supports under the board. Now before I insert the three cross members under here, which will go here and here and here, it's worth thinking about the track plan because the last thing I want to do is, um, is commit to putting the cross members where exactly where these tortoise point motors are going to run. So nothing like planning is there. So there's the rough area of where these points are going to be and I can see that for the initial uh, right hand, the point motor is, is, is free, the double slip is between so that one's good. Um, I don't really want this one next to there, that's going to get a little bit close to this member so I can put a small piece of track there which will pull this left away. So there will be a left and a right um, and that one's good and then this um, one to the goods line can really go anywhere. So that's fine. So what I shall do now is remove the points, install these three supports underneath here to make sure this board doesn't sag. And then I can get around to start thinking about exactly where these points are going to go. At least we know in our own mind now that um, point motors won't become an issue under the board because there are a lot of points really quite close in. What is it? Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six here. And then one on the next board. Sorry, two on the next board. Great. Well, I've now bolted in the, the middle one of those three. And to make sure that the incline's still right, well, it's not rocket science, is it? If I get a straight edge between this one and the start, then all I need to do is bring it up um, until it meets it and obviously make sure it's horizontal. And that's exactly what I shall do for the first one and the third one. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and if you hit the little bell icon and go for all then you get a notification every time I release a new video. Well that's the five supports in and I must confess they're level, well level they're straight I should say. But I can't help but think now I look at this that there must be carpenters watching this with their their head in their hands thinking what on earth is he doing? But Hey, it's bits of scrap timber and uh, it's pretty sturdy, so we're kind of there really. So what do we do next? Well, I need to pop this back on the top. And then put in that final clamp on the end. And then underneath, I need to mark the positions of these supports so that I know my point motors will all be clear of them. So that will help no end now when it comes to 
positioning those point motors. Now I've put the boards to the helix back in place and I've drawn another line on top of this other piece of ply um, to straighten out this edge and it will also um, give a better angle for a retaining wall to run along. Now try, if I was to put this in place and then try to cut that with a, a jigsaw I'd end up in a hell of a mess. So now's the time to take this back outside and cut along this line um, and hopefully that should be the, the final cut to this. Then I need to start thinking about some timbers underneath to give this a bit more rigidity. Now searching around the railway room to try to find a bit of timber to strengthen this board um, and all I'm left really is with this square timber here which is somewhat over engineered as usual and if this is 45 millimetre square planed or in old money probably two inch square timber. Now it seems quite sensible that all you're going to do is drill a couple of holes along your baseboard um, for the, the pilot holes for the screws to go in and then get a, a countersink and then make the countersink hole to hide the top of the screw and that's what I did in a previous video. However, one fine gentleman put me on to these things. So what is it? Well, it's a small drill with a countersink piece attached and then you can slide it up and down by adjusting the Allen key. It's a great time saver if, you, if like me, you don't own two great big drills. But for £10 or so from Amazon, you get this selection, which truly is um, exceptional value. These aren't going to be the best drills in the world, but hey ho, for 10 quid, you know, it is what it is really. So how simple is it to use? Very simple. So all I need to do is with the drill fitted, go straight in. No, sorry, I know I've got a two inch timber here, so I know exactly where to sort of drill through. And it gives you your countersink hole at the same time. It really couldn't be much simpler. So now all I need to do is just switch the drill bit for the screwdriver and whack them in. Don't we love good tools? Beautiful. So here it is with the bracing in place and I've deliberately left this area clear because this is a way where it will have to bend around um, to come off the incline. It's now considerably heavier as you can imagine. But I did notice that it was starting to warp already. Once you cut these, these um, plywood sheets down they do start to distort quite easily. Anyway, if I just clamp the end as usual and then the only change that will come now is this obviously needs to get screwed to all the cross members when I finish sorting out the track and you can see there as it starts to lift. The tool for these, that countersink drill arrangement, um, I will leave a link in the show more tab so you can go on Amazon and get them for a tenner. It does strike me as a bit of a bargain um, but it is what it is. Right. Lay some track now, I imagine. Crack on with that one. Now you might be aware that I like Woodland Scenic's foam track bed. The noise transmission through the foam into the wood um, is minimal really, and if you use cork, the noise transmission is, is greater, let's say. But of course, it's the ballast that really transmits the sound, and I'm still trying to figure out um, on a rubber-based ballast glue, which is, um, always going to be an issue. So what am I going to do now? Well the first thing I'm going to do now is lay the rest of this track plan out with the foam track bed and see how it looks, make sure it looks okay. Then I shall start fitting the points. Now the only difficult one really is at the start because to feed this double slip I've got this left hand point here and it bridges this gap, no big deal once this is screwed down but this area here will be a little bit awkward to get to with a tortoise point motor but it's not unsurmountable because I've wired the tortoise motor up prior to installing it. It's just getting those four screws in may be a little bit of a challenge getting in through here. Still, we love the adventure, don't we? So, um, all I've got to do then is lay the rest of these points when all this track bed is sorted. And on the subject of points, I thought I'd just bring your attention to these options from Pico. So as you may be aware, Pico points come in three sizes. There's a, a long, medium and a short, 
and there's electrofrog or insular frog. Well, these are all electrofrog points because I believe they're more reliable, but there is a bit of a, a, a little bit more of a complication with wiring up the, the frog. Um, but which ones should you use? Well, if space isn't an issue, then you know use the long ones. They're more reliable and they look better as your trains go through them. If, of course, it's a small shunting yard, you know, the short ones perhaps are ideal. But when you run long trains with coaches through some of these points, they don't look that good because the coaches tend to, um, the angle as they transfer through the points, through the, the networks, doesn't look too nice. So I, whenever it, you have a choice, um, because space isn't limiting you, then I would go for the, the long points. And besides that, you can take these, you know, at a greater speed than you can these. But, you know, each to our own, and of course only you know um, how your budget sits, and of course the main thing is the space available. And now going back to this foam track bit, uh, hopefully you can see that it's been used before because you can see the, the copy decks underneath it, and obviously where I've glued some track down, the odd hole where there was a, a point motor. So what do I do to put this stuff down? Well, I have a liking for copy decks. Um, it's a glue that was used in schools, really. It smells of fish, if, you can, uh, if you've ever tried it. And um, you don't need a great deal with this stuff. You just sort of whack it on and then put a few weights on. You don't need that much because in the fullness of time, um, the ballast will hold everything down. Um, and when I put my track work on top of this, I will either use those small Pico track screws which you saw earlier or I would just copy dex the track down as well. The disadvantage of using screws and small track pins when you uh, secure your track is that if you overdo it then you can actually pull the rails towards the um, Pull, pull, the, pull the rails in by if you depress the sleepers and you can and obviously the, the lines can then sort of go out of gauge so just uh, something you need to be aware of and of course in the fullness of time running your trains over these pins you know especially when you, you see it in people's videos sometimes they just look awful but it's a personal choice you should do what really works for you and this is quite straightforward because I know the gap. Oh, one thing worth mentioning, and that's this, the Pico six foot way gauge. And this gives you the distance between the rails on streamline, and that gives you the distance between the rails and set track. So my rails should, using the streamline one, should be that distance apart. And I know that if I now turn this over and lay it down, hopefully without it going everywhere, which it will always try to, if I just put the minimal gap between these layers of track foam bed like that, when I put this in position, the centre of those lugs should sit squarely within the, the, uh, the foam. So that the centre lines should line up with there, and they do. It's not a surprise really because I know that if you have just a small gap down the middle, then the tracks will look right. So all I've got to do then is run the rest of these sidings through and we'll see how it looks. Well, that's all the track bed now in place. So where do we go from here? Well, I've laid the points in place. So now I need to wire those up, drill the holes for the point motors going through the boards and connect up all the cables. Now, when wiring points, you may be aware of a modification that's often done to electrofrog points. And this is one that's previously been done and this one hasn't. So clearly there's the frog wire and you need to solder a cable on the end of the frog wire. And in here, in the centre here, there are two uh, wires that enable power to go from the frogs to the switch blades. And the modification is you cut through those wires and then connect those two rails together with a pair of droppers. So what needs to be done on here, if you wish to uh, pursue this method, is like say, is, is to snip through those two and then do some soldering on there. And what this does, it adds for, it leads to better running because you're not relying then on the power from the switch blades here to power up to the rest of the, 
the, the, the um, switch rails and the frog. We're powering them independently. And it's worth mentioning at this stage that the cable sizes for the whole of this area will be uh, 1602, that's 16 strands of 0.02 millimetre cable, except for the point work that will be in 702. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, you need to take a look at last week's video, video number 124, which is all about wiring. And in there, there are some tremendous links to some great cable supplies and some real good information, not only about the, um, the British way of, uh, of doing it with 702, but also the American wire gauge. So it's 1602 all over with the exception of the points. Now constructing model railway boards like I do in a modular manner has its advantages because clearly when it comes to wiring them up, you can stick them on a table and things become much easier. So I can put the track down, turn the board over and do the wiring. Um, it just makes things far easier. And if I ever need to move house, then you can take these units out as a, as a whole section rather, in, rather than um, taking a hacksaw to it. Now I don't really mean to bore you to death with laying all the points, so I thought I would just show you how I lay one. Um, the double slip is already in, and so this is the next one, which is the left hand electrofrog point. And it's electrofrog, so I need two insulated rail joiners on the end. This is not an electrofrog double slip, it's an insular frog, so I don't need the insulated rail joiners. I mentioned before that because of the beams underneath, I need a small spacer. So there's this piece of track here. But what I need to do, no, oh, and I've already put in the um, frog cable and the power to this point. So what I need to do now is to figure out exactly where to drill the hole for the port tortoise point motors um, actuating arm to come up. So what I've got is that track spacer. So I shall thread that one on first. Then push this onto the double slip. Like so, push that down and just check that it lines up. All good, yes we are. And the trick is now, or the way I do it, is I find, I get a, a track pin and I cut the head off. And I cut the head off so I can thread it through the hole in the point motor switch blade. So, I put the blades in the central position, then I pop that track pin in and then hopefully I can just lift this back out again and pull it all out of the way like so and there's the track pin and obviously it's made a mark in the foam rubber not losing sight of where that is that is where I need to drill my hole excuse the noise Now I'm very cautious about screwing going right through into the table. So I just move out of the way a moment. Let me go wide with you. And there's the hole, good to go. Now, I've invested in one of these little... <laughs> ...vacuum cleaners after being ridiculed in an earlier video for not having one. So how do I secure it down? Well, I use a spot of copy decks now. I keep away from the hole where the point motor is going to go and I keep away from this area here, which is where the switch blades will be. So that's where I put my copy decks, not too much. And then we need to wiggle it back in. So I feed these cables back down. 
and then line up those fish plates with the double slit once more. No, nope, not quite. It's very easy to get them on one side but not the other. And there we go. Pop those back in. Oh, that that um, frog cables got a little kink in it. them in. My hole looks pretty good for where I drilled it through as you'd expect really and then make sure I've got no kinks in the direction of travel for the point that looks square up and then I can use these tiny pico screws to hold it in position whilst the copy decks goes off. Now you could just cover it in books to keep it still, which works, but I, it means I can no longer start tipping up the board and carrying on with my progress. So if I just put a screw at either end, just to hold it still whilst it, oops, whilst it dries, And you can feel it bite into the into the board. And I shall put one in here. And just looking at it now, I haven't put much copy decks under there, so I'm just going to pop a dot more underneath this point. It looks messy, but it's no big deal, as long as, of course, it comes away from the... It keep it away from the switch blades. Right. So pop the second screw in. Always sounds easier than it is, doesn't it? I know a lot of American railroad modellers, as they're known, swear by these screws. But in the UK, we just tend to be gluers or pinners, don't we? Right, I need to look down there. And to me, it looks dead straight, which isn't necessarily an advantage, is it? How often do we see dead straight tracks? Right, so that's how I do it. Um, the, um, obviously the actuation arm will, will come up in the middle of that hole. This is free to move and we just a case now of working our way down the layout. But that's the basics of how I do my point laying. Obviously the point motor's got to go on underneath here. Those two cables that um, feed this point need to go back to a junction box and obviously the uh, frog cable needs to come up and join the tortoise point motor for when the point changes the, the, the polarity of the frog will change. So I shall just get on and do the rest. Well now the track is down and wired um, although the point motors haven't been installed underneath. I've cut out this section here because I have concerns about the radiator over on against the wall and what I thought I would do is do the same against the the board that comes next to this over the helix so that any heat coming up for the radiator will be free to, to move up as it were and when I want to play trains I'll have a piece of scenery that just sits over here and masks um, that gap. So it's now time to pop it back over there and uh, see how it looks. The trick is now is to avoid standing on all the cables that are hanging down. Remembering of course that DCC is obviously <laughs> just the two wires. Oh, 
Okay, sadly I'm unable to connect these two lines up to the viaduct as without the uh, all the point motors secure to the underside of this board um, I'm unable to do so because this board will have to come out and go on its side to allow me to fit all the point motors in plus all the cable wiring but at the end of the day it's looking pretty good. I think the addition of the double slip is a masterpiece and Lee I'm very grateful for it um, and the the way this will work I'm quite uh, looking forward to this because when trains say okay, going to or from this this goods yard then obviously they'll be held back by a set of signals here allowing the passenger traffic to take priority to go in and out so the the operational interest here I think will be um, be, be quite good. Um, where do I go from here? Well I'll leave this as it is, I won't go over the helix next. Um, once this is complete I'll head, then head off towards the viaduct so I can get these lines connected and then we can get some kind of miniature running session in hand. Now while I remember I owe someone my sincere thanks because a couple of weeks ago I was seen hopping into the centre of this helix and someone spotted the risks to do with these um, somewhat vicious M8 um, threaded rod poking up and the damage I can do myself. Um, so to one of my patrons who's, um, I do appreciate your support, I really do, and without embarrassing you, he lives in Piper's Close by the way, um, thank you very much indeed in supporting me. And um, people ask me for my home address because they want to send me stuff to have a look at or perhaps do a review or whatever. I'm sorry, but I don't give away my home address. If you want to send me anything like that, then please send it to DCC Train Automation and they'll, ask, they'll give me a ring and I'll come in and collect it from there. Well, that just about wraps up this video, but I hope you found it interesting, if not useful. But laying those tracks up an incline, I found quite, um, quite interesting, really. A little bit of a challenge to try to get the slope right. And of course, it's all in the planning, it's all in the design, because you can't just nail these bits of timber in and hope your trains go up them, because invariably they won't. So it is worth doing a little bit of investigative work to make sure your trains will go up it. Um, and that little DMU went up it just fine. So I think we've got, we're on to a winner there. As usual, I'd like to thank the patrons and the people who donate to the channel because without your help, I really wouldn't be able to manage it. So there's a button there if you'd like to become a patron. And please don't forget to subscribe. And there should be a video here and here. And I'll see you next week. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.